repentance, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. And lo, I'll be with you always to the very end. That is the great commission. That's the great mission God has given us. Now we communicate that in a lot of different ways. In this particular church here at Living Water, one of the things that we really felt like the Lord is, is, is calling us out to do is to help people find freedom. Because a lot of times we get saved, but we never have, we, we have the freedom, but then we don't take it, we don't live in it, we don't walk in it, and therefore we find ourselves going right back to the same bondages that have messed up our life to begin. When a church loses sight of its own mission, that's when you, how many of you have attended some churches that are very stagnant and haven't done anything for, for years and, 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 they're, and they're dying? The reason why a church is dying, the reason why a church is lazy or complacent or stagnant is because they forgot their entire reason for existence. The body of Christ is not a country club. The body of Christ is the body of Christ sent out to serve and minister as the body of Christ. So every year I always, at some point throughout every year, I will preach a series of sermons on our mission to remind us of everything that we're here to do. And uh, this week, uh, that is exactly what the Lord had poured into to my heart to do. Um, and so one of the things is as we have a mission statement, we also have two mission verses. And so when you see this, you're going to see this heart a lot. And there's always this dividing line in this heart. On one side, we're dealing with freedom. And on the other side, we're dealing with purpose. And one of the things that you're going to see a lot of this, it's going to remind us that that we need to get the freedom before we actually find our purpose. A lot of times people will get saved and they'll immediately, they'll immediately want to get involved in ministry. They they're, they got saved. They finally felt something happen in their life. They've been forgiven and all of a sudden now they're just running straight into to um, serving and, and ministering. And then all of a sudden they find that, you know, they, 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 they just gave everything over to one side. They never really walked through any kind of, of, of working through any of their garbage or the junk in the trunk and then all of a sudden all that junk that's never been dealt with in the trunk starts finding itself in the ministry. Has anybody ever experienced that? So a lot of times what I want us to learn is that we can still serve but we really need to work through and find our freedoms from our past hurts, habits, and hang-ups Get over some of these things that have been dragging us down for years so that we don't drag them into where God wants us to serve and, and do that. So Galatians 5.1 is our freedom verse. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. See, a lot of people, we like the first part, but we don't like when we have to do anything. Well, guess what? This gives us an assignment, stand firm. Stand firm then and do not be burdened again. See, this is talking about something that's happened in your past. Don't go back again to something that already has been ruining your life. Don't be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. The Bible tells us that we're a slave to something. Everybody's a slave to something. We're either a slave to Christ or we're a slave to sin. Paul constantly said, I'm a bond servant. And in, in the in a NIV or some of the, the other translations, sometimes it kind of makes it sound a lot nicer than really what the truth of the language is and where it says, uh, he says, I'm, I'm a servant of Christ. The actual word is slave. He says, I am a bond slave. A bond slave was somebody who got into a position where they couldn't pay their debt and there was no way out of this. And so what they would do so that they didn't lose everything that they had in their families and everything. They would go to the person they're in debt to and say, I can't pay this debt. I will bond myself in servitude to you until my debt is paid. And they would bond themselves as a slave to that person so that they don't lose the farm, so to speak. And they would serve and follow that person and, and, and serve until their debt is paid. And then they were freed to go back to their homes. The other pap, the purpose statement is in Romans 9.17. It says, I raised you up for this very purpose. That I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed. And actually what's interesting about this verse is it's actually talking about Pharaoh. <laughs> that God raised Pharaoh up for that very purpose. If you remember, Pharaoh was so stubborn headed and he refused to give in to God's demands. He refused 
to follow Christ. Have you ever found somebody that refused to follow Christ? Right? They just refused. So he was so stubborn, he's like, I refuse. So every time he saw God do something amazing, he then would say, yes, you can take the people, just make this, this curse stop, make this plague stop. So the plague stopped, and he goes, no, I changed my mind again. So he changed his mind ten times, and then finally he gave in. And so God says, I raised you up for this very purpose. See, here's the thing. You're all going to make name, God's name great. You can either do this on the good side or on the bad side. God's going, you, at, at the end of the day, you're going you're gonna to display power to God. You're going you're gonna to advance his name one way or another, whether he is dealing with you harshly or whether he is blessing your life one way or the other. Pharaoh was on the wrong side of this verse. I raise you for this ver- that I might display my power. What God really wants is when we give our life to Christ, what he really wants is that every time you're living life, how many times have you found yourself in your life where you were too weak to do what you knew you needed to do, right? God, I know what you want me to do, but I'm so weak, I feel like I can't do this, right? So he wants to give you his power so that you're doing it in his name, not in your own name. I can't get through this by myself. So then God supplies the power for me to get through something I can't get through. So at the end of the day, his name is glorified. His name is praised. So, going all the way to where our church got its name is in John 4. I, Barbara and I were, were pastors elsewhere, or I was a pastor, she's my wife, she's making sure she's, she's correcting me, but um, uh, my wife uh, and I were at, a, at, a, at another church, and God had released us from that church, and so I, w- I was sitting there, and, and I'm like, well, what do we do? What, what do you want me to do? And God laid planting a church on my heart and he and and just this thing kept coming over there's got to be a place where anybody can go there's got to be a place where anybody can walk in and be loved right where they're at and they're and they can hear the gospel and other people will love them and not just the pastor not just the pastor so many times churches have lost their love their love had grown cold and people walk in and they feel like they're not wanted, they're not loved. And I wanted to see, I was like, God, there's got to be a place. And there's got to be a place that's like, we need a place for misfits. Actually, where, where, where the heart of this came from was uh, I was watching with my kids, uh, a long time ago, I was watching with my kids this, this movie, um, you know, the old uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? The old one. And all of a sudden, I saw this island of misfit toys and it was just like, we need a church like that. Like, where all the misfits could go. If you don't fit in anywhere else, you can fit into this church, right? There's a church. There's got to be a church where all the misfits can go. And that was really then, then I was like, well, we can't call this, you know, I mean, we could have. We could have, you know, first church of misfits. But, but you know, I started, Barbara, what are we going to, what, what, where does the, the name, you know, it needs to connect to Warsaw or this area. And we, we, you know, and then all of a sudden we were studying in John 4. John 4 is the very heartbeat of what we want this church to be. So I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. This is the story of the woman at the well. And what's an amazing story that, that so many cultural barriers were shattered during this story and Jesus overcame the, the cultural acceptance, what was accepted in the culture. Uh, and there's just so many, so many truths about this story that is relevant to us today. We're not going to get into all of them, but here's, here's what we're in, in chapter 4. John chapter 4 says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So he, he's going back to Galilee, but now he had to go through Samaria. So to get to Galilee, he's going to go through Samaria. So the, the Pharisees are putting some heat on him. The religious people of the church are putting some heat on Jesus. So he's like, i got to get out of Judea. I'm going to go back to Galilee. Now, all the Pharisees... The, the, all the religious people, they won't walk through Samaria. Samaria is a place where uh, a, a Samaritan was this. They were, they were half Jew 
and half Gentile, that made a, a Samaritan. So the Jews hated Samaria. They hated Samaritans because they looked at it as you're watering down our race. That it's a very racist thing, but that's exactly what the, was, what the situation was. So Jews would walk 11 extra miles, 11 extra miles, extra they're walking. They didn't have cars. It's not like, well, you know, I want, I'm going to drive around. And so it would be like somebody from Warsaw not liking Lincoln. Like, I'm going to drive all the way around so that I don't have to go through Lincoln. So they would have to drive down to Clinton. Then they would drive over. To, you know, so that's what they would be doing. But see, we're talking about driving. You know, that's just some gas money. But when you're walking it, you're hoofing it. They walked 11 extra miles just not to walk through Samaria. Just to get you an idea of the hatred that the Jews had for Samaria. And there's a lot of other things in their past that we do not have time to get into. But they hated him. So Jesus, he's like, I'm just going to go through Samaria. And then he knows that the Jews aren't going to mess with him there. At least I'm going to have some peace from the Jews. The, you know, these, these, these Pharisees that are, that are hounding him. So Jesus goes through Samaria. So you need to understand that he, you know, there's not going to be any Jewish people there because this is, a, this is an outcast. This is the land of the misfits, all right? The, Samaria is the, the island of misfit toys, okay? So here Jesus is, and he goes there. Now, verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in, in Samaria called Sychar near a plot of... Of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a woman, some, uh, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a moment. We're going to look at four different things that this woman was chained to. This is talking about bondage. This is talking about slavery. You know, when we're talking about our past hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and all the things that we're dealing with. So here's a woman. She shows up at noon. This is not the time that they drew water. They drew the water in the early morning and in the late evening because that was the coolest times of the day. And you're dealing with the Middle East. Okay, so it's hot there. So, you know, you're, you're, you're surrounded by a lot of desert. So here's the thing is, it is not a cool time of the day. So nobody was going there. So she is going at a time that no one else does. Okay. This woman is chained by her past sin. Her past sin is dictating to her when she's going to show up. To get water. She wants to make sure she avoids all the people. I want to avoid people. So I'm going to go when no one else goes. Why does our past sin seem to have so much control over us? Think about this. How many times in your own life have you had sin in it, so from your past? Something, well, I mean anything that, you know, becomes past very quickly. But the sin... From your past is still controlling some of your actions today. Anybody? Some of the past sin of your life is still controlling your actions. And, and let me give you an easy example. Um, all right. So um, with her, she we're going to find out here in a little bit that she's had five failed marriages. And the man that she's living with now is not even her own husband. So we, we, she's kind of a, she's in a, in a, in a situation. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. But now that, because of those failed relationships, has dictated that she doesn't want to see anybody in town. So sometimes we've done something wrong in our past, and now we hide our face from the people in the, of the town, right? So some, we've done something, something's happened in our life, and where we kind of just hide. That's where she's at in her life. She's hiding. She's coming out in the middle of the day to get water because she doesn't want to run into anybody that she might know which in a small town is everybody. So a lot of times our past sin seems to have some kind of a hold on us. And you know what? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We're already free from it. Why is it still holding us? You see, that's the problem, is that we get saved and we don't even understand the freedom that we've been given. It shouldn't have a hold on you anymore. And yet we will live our lives and we'll live our entire life being chained to this past sin of our life. And I start thinking, why? Why do, why do our past sins? It's, it, it, the answer is found in Jeremiah 3.25. It says, let us acknowledge 
and I'm not gonna, we're not going to spend very much time there, but it says, let us acknowledge our shame. See, what happens is your past sin, if it's a shameful sin, something that you're not proud of, we're so ashamed of it, we're still trying to hide it as if it never happened. He said the problem in Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, let us acknowledge it. Here's the reality is that most of the time when we have a shameful sin of our past, everybody already knows. And we're still trying to hide it as if no one knows. They already know. God already knows. He says, let us acknowledge it. The first step in any recovery program is to admit it. Admit. That's the first thing. Admit that I'm not God. Admit that I've got trouble. Admit that my, my life is unmanageable if you're in CR. But here's the, it comes all the way back. It's a biblical thing. Jeremiah says, let us acknowledge it. If we can't acknowledge the, the, the mess of our past, then you're never going to get over it because you're still trying to hide it. We're putting this shame, these shameful things, this disgraceful things, the sins that we're not a proud of, and we have them in a closet as if we're really hiding them, but they're still there because we haven't dealt with it. When you hide from your sin long enough, you'll begin to hide from people. How many people hide from church because they feel guilty every time they walk in the doors because of a past sin? Has any of you ever been to that place where you felt so guilty of your sin? You like, I can't even go to church. I'm so bad. Church is a hospital. That's exactly if you wanted to find some kind of irrelevant, like what is the church? How do we understand what the church is? The hospital is the closest thing. What do we do when we're sick? You go to the hospital. But yet what the devil has us messed up in our minds saying, well, if you've got sin in your life, you better not go to church. That's what the devil wants. But when we hide from our sin long enough, our past sin, then we begin to hide from everybody else. Well, he then, he's sitting there. This woman is, is coming at, the, at, the, at an interesting time. Verse uh, 7, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, a, a Jew would probably rather thirst, uh, die of thirst than to get a drink of water from a Samaritan. That's how pride and how, how, how much they, the hatred was there. So she's absolutely shocked, not being sarcastic, completely shocked that a Jew and a Jewish man at that would ask her. Who am I that, that you would ask me for a drink of water? So... You have this woman, he's, he's asking her, and then I love how he answered after she says, you know, how are you asking me? Jesus, verse 10, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drink from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will dwell and be, er, will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Look at how the woman answered. Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's not worried about the salvation he just asked. She just wants the outside stuff fixed. Just, I want to get this water so that I don't have to keep coming to this well and facing people. It had nothing to do with the eternal life. She missed it. We can get so wrapped up in sin that we can miss exactly what God has offered us. So one of the things is she's chained to insecurity. Insecurity. Every one of you has struggled with insecurity. Now how many of you kind of typically are pretty confident people? I, I know that my wife says she... That, that's definitely me. So how many of you just kind of run typically pretty confident? Okay. All right. Okay. So, so, so there's several people in the room. And then a, lot of, a lot of confident people, like, yeah, I don't struggle with insecurity. 
every one of us has struggled with insecurity. So raise your hand real tall if you're the, the, the confident ones in the room. So I just want to maybe kind of maybe prove a point, and you're probably going to then try to be extra overly confident right now and, and prove me wrong, which is okay. God loves you still. How many of you who are super confident people have struggled with like a fear of failure? Okay, see, point taken, right? Fear of failure is an insecurity. See, every person, every human being on this earth has struggled different times in their life with insecurities. If you've ever had a fear of failure, raise your hand. I just want you to stand up. If you've ever dealt with fear of failure, just stand up. Okay. Very good. All right. Now, how many of you, same people, we're going to have to start using our arms and legs now. Out of you who have struggled with a fear of failure, how many of you in addition, or if you're still sitting, this will be the time that you'll stand, have a fear of rejection, like I've been afraid that people will reject me. Raise your hand if you're fear of rejection, okay? Okay, then let me go on one step further. How many of you have had a fear of being found out? And you're like, what does he mean? Some of you know what exactly, like where you're afraid if somebody finds out who you really are, they're not going to love you anymore. That's a big one. A one that we don't like to admit, but it's a fear nonetheless. It's like, if they knew who I really was in here, right? They won't love me. If God really knew me, he already knows you. But see, we all struggle with insecurity. How many of you now use your other hand? How many of you felt like I had, you know, like I'm not good enough? Raise up the other hand. Now, outside of the liars, every one of us has dealt with insecurity. You may be seated. What I'm wanting you to understand is that insecurity is not a part of God's plan for you. This is the devil's plan. If he can get you to live in your insecurity, you'll never, you'll never get water in the morning or in the evening. You're always going to be trying to hide in the middle. You know, you're going to be getting your water at the middle of the day. She was so wanting this living water so that she didn't have to face people. Not so that she could be healed from the pain of her life. It's a big difference. What Jesus was offering her was completely different than what she actually thought she wanted. Now, if she actually gets what, she, what, what, what Jesus is offering, if she ever accepts this thing that he's offering, it's going to change her life completely. We'll see if that happens. So, insecurity is a feeling of not being good enough. It's a struggle with self-confidence. But it also creates all different kinds of fears in our life. And insecurities will end up coming to a place where you try to mask it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Now, here in verse 16 now, he told her, go and call your husband. And she goes, I want the, sir, give me this water. I, I don't want to have to get thirsty. I don't want to come here. So Jesus is like, well, she still doesn't get it. I'm going to have to go a little bit deeper. Go call your husband. Go, go get your husband. <laughs> she says, uh, I have no husband. He goes, you're right. You're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and the man you're with right now is not yours. She's like, man, why did I open my mouth? Why did I have to say anything, right? But the thing is, is that he already knows because he's the savior of the world. Just like all the hidden sin that we keep trying to hide, he already knows your deepest, darkest secret. He was there. He saw you do it. Right? So here's the thing is that he already knows. And look, he already knew that she's had five failed marriages. And now she's, she's, she's in the middle of an adulterous relationship right now. And guess what? He still loves her. That's what's so amazing is here's the deal. You have this, this, this woman who is not doing the right thing. She's, she's, she's gotten herself in a big, big pile of poo. And Jesus is still there. He still showed up. He could have sat there and go, no, I'm going to wait for the next woman that's walked by. I don't want water from this woman. He could have said, you know what, I already know what's going to happen. I'm Jesus. I know who's coming. So I don't want to be there when she shows up. See, that's not Jesus. 
Jesus is the one who's sitting there waiting for you to come out of hiding. And he's waiting for you to show up so that he can give you love. That he can help you with healing. That he can begin to fix the problems of your past. That's who Jesus is. So he says they're right. You've had, then all of a sudden she's like, oh, now listen to this. This is so amazing. <laughs> Jesus is so patient with her. He goes, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you said is quite true. Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Skips right over the sin thing, right? It's not like, oh, you're right. Oh, man, I'm an idiot. Oh, I really messed my life up. Can you, do you think you could maybe help? Sir, you're a prophet. Now help me with my next problem. Are we supposed to worship here on this mountain, or are we supposed to worship over there in Jerusalem like you Jews do it? I mean, she skips right over again the heart of the issue because she's still living on the external. She's still trying to live on this outward appearance of things. So what happens when we're not really dealing with the stuff inside of us, we stick to working on the outward. So she's not concerned about the heart of her, where the sin is residing. She's not really worried about that. She goes, oh, wow, you're a prophet. I've got some questions for you. Skips right over the sin stuff. Skips right over the failed relationships. So here's a woman that's chained by her past sin. She's chained by um, insecurity. She's chained by, by, um, by failed relationships. And, and you, you, here's the thing. I want you to, you know, this is something that you might want to write down. One of the things that the Lord has been showing me about failed relationships. Why do we have so many failed relationships? Why do we have so many failed marriages? Why do we have so many relationships that end and end and end? And why do we have this cycle of really unhealthy, bad relationships? I'm going to give you, through the greatest commandment, I'm going to give you the greatest truth of it. The great commandment is what? Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, right? That's number one. That's the number one relationship in my life that I, that I got to make sure that we don't fail this relationship. Love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul. And if you think about it, when God is the center of a marriage... He's truly the sinner. And a husband and the wife both love him with all of their heart, mind, body, and soul. They don't have as many problems. Am I right? Come on. When, when one of them is not loving the Lord as much as the other one is, then all of a sudden we start having some problems. When neither one of them are loving him with all of their heart, mind, body, and soul, there's a lot of problems. But he says the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm here to tell you, if you can't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. When you have insecurity in your life, I'm so amazed at how so many people will begin some kind of a recovery program and they'll start seeing a little bit of success and they'll start having a better relationship with God, immediately want to go find somebody. i got to find my, my soulmate. And they haven't even got themselves fixed. I'm going to tell you what you're going to find. A mess. Because you're a mess. And they're a mess. And you haven't fixed your mess. So you're going to bring your mess into this relationship. And they're bringing their mess into that. And now you got even a bigger mess. Because we're in such a hurry. Come on, you know I'm right. A lot of you have made those mistakes. You're laughing because some of you are like, oh man, I've done that like nine times. Stop it. <laughs> Think about it. You've got to, one, get it right with God. That's number one, step number one. Get it right with God. Number two, get it right with yourself. One, some of you got to forgive yourself from the past sin. If God has already forgiven you, why are you holding on to it? So you got to forgive yourself. So you got to start loving yourself before you can ever love somebody else. And if you still hate yourself, you're not ready for a relationship. Even if you're in one. If I'm hating myself and I'm with my wife, I cannot give her the love that God demands of me. Now, does that mean that I should divorce my wife? Absolutely not. What I need to realize in my life is that I've got to get some stuff fixed in me. That she needs to know, honey, I'm really sorry that I'm a terrible person right now. I'm sorry that I'm a terrible jerk. I, please forgive me. I don't love myself right now and I don't know how to love you right. Please don't leave me while I'm trying to figure it out. That's the kind of conversation that should happen. Yeah. 
So, now, one, the last thing that it says is that she's chained to unrepented sin. There's not any verses that I'm going to show you. It's the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing. Not one time did she ever admit her sin, did she? Even when it was brought up clear, clear to her, she still didn't deal with the sin. You see, a lot of times is this, that sometimes we really just don't like dealing with sin. We don't, do we? Let's be honest, we don't like dealing with sin. We like looking at other people's sin, and we even like using other people's sin as an excuse for our sin. Are you kidding me? Sin is sin. You've got your sin. You deal with yours. You've got your sin. You deal with yours. But when we have unrepented sin, sin is this. You know what the Bible says about sin? Crucify your sinful nature. See, Jesus isn't playing around with sin in our life. He tells us, you got to go crucify that stuff. you got to crucify it. you got to nail that sin to the cross and be done with it. we got to hate sin. If you don't start hating sin, you're going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. we got to get to a place where I reject that sin. I reject that thought. I, re I will throw my computer away. I will throw my phone out the door before I do that again and, and disgrace my Savior. we got to get to the point of saying, God, I love you more. Right? God, I love you more. So whatever you're struggling with, God, I love you more than the alcohol. I love you more than the lust. I love you more than pornography. I love you more than same-sex attraction. I love you more than the bitterness that's inside of me. I love you more than my anger. I love you more. I love you more than all of it. That's the only time that you're ever going to be able to get, begin to let it go. You're holding on to your sin as if it's some trophy. You did this to me, so I'm this. No one can make you that except you. No one can make you sin but you. No matter how bad somebody is to you, you got to own that. They'll deal, God will deal with each person individually, but you've got to deal with you. And that's what unrepented. She was wanting, like, hey, who's right, the Samaritans or the Jews? Where are we going to worship and where are we going to do all this stuff? She skipped right over the sin part. You know, the hardest thing about sin is that we most of the time justify our sin. And we make it not sin for us because of what somebody else did. How many of you have been guilty of that? You know where we see it the most is unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. I'm angry, I'm hurt, and I'm, I'm mad at this person, and I'm mad at this person because of them. So then we allow the anger, and we allow it to reside in our hearts. It is allowed now to live there, and it destroys everything about us. And then we say, well, it's okay because that person... God doesn't want you to be angry. He doesn't want you to be bitter. He doesn't want you to be ruined. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be happy. He wants, and we'll, we'll blame our unhappiness on somebody else. How many times do we do that? Oh, you're not very happy. Well, it's this person's fault that I'm not happy. So them equals your happiness. You got that wrong. The happiness that God has given us, it's from him and it's for you. Each one of you should be living a life filled with joy. So let me show you. I love it in verse 25. I'm glad I, when I set my Bible down, I'm glad I marked it. In verse 25, I love this. So he, he tells her to go do this. She's explaining all these things. But in verse 25, she says, well, she goes, verse 25, she goes, I know that the Messiah called the Christ. He's coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything. Because she didn't really like his answer, right? He says, well, you know, what you guys don't understand is that, you know, God coming from the Jews and, and you know, we're going to worship him in spirit and truth. And she goes, she's like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. When the Messiah comes, he'll explain things. And I love this. All of a sudden, her eyes are about to get an awakening, right? He's coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything. And Jesus says, I, the one who speak to you, am he. I am that guy. This is the turning point in the conversation. This is the beginning, the turning point. When she comes face to face with the Messiah. 
Now, I'm going to take a little time out from the story. I'm going to mark myself here because there's a couple of things that I want to, I want to talk about. So you're going to see this is going to come out in your, in your notes from the sermon. It's one big picture. I'm taking this a little bit at a time. So here's the thing that we so find often. So most and, and as I watch a lot of recovery programs, we're so focused on the outward fruit. It, every, almost every recovery program I've ever seen is so focused on the fruit. We're focused on, on, on the drunkenness. We're, we're focused on substance abuse. We're, we're focused on eating disorders. We're, we're focused on the anger. We're focused on the unforgiveness. We're focused on the jealousy, slander, gossip, lust, judgment, um, rebellion, uh, attitude, judgmentalness, whatever it is, we're so focused on these fruits that we don't like. How many of you have done that a lot of your life? You're focused on the things that you, you see what's happening. I don't like that I'm angry. I don't like that I'm drunk. I don't like that I keep going to drugs. I don't like being addicted. I don't like being lustful. I don't like, and we start naming all these things that we don't like that we're doing. That's the fruit. That's not your problem. That's a symptom of the problem. And you know what, when you go to a lot of hospitals, have you found that when you go to a hospital and they don't know what's wrong with you, they just give you medication that masks the symptoms of the problem and you don't fix the problem? Sometimes us churches get guilty of the same thing. We get into those places and we're like, I really don't know what's wrong with you, so we're just going to try to mask it with something else. See, because of our insecurities in our life, Feelings of I'm not good enough, fear of failure, rejection, the lack of, uh, a lack of sense of belonging. All these, all these different fears and all these different insecurities, they begin to lead to all those fruits that we're doing. When we start noticing in our life that, you know, you may not like being a drunk or a drug addict or addicted to pornography or, um, you know, messing up all the relationships in your life. You look at this and I don't like doing those, but where are they really coming from? See, why did you start drinking? Why did you go to drugs? Why are you addicted to pornography? Why are you going to this? Why are you unforgiving? Why are you angry? Why are you a jealous person? Why are you filled with hatred? Why, 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 why? Because the thing is, we look at the fruit and say, I want to stop doing that. So God, I'm sorry that I'm doing that. Well, that's a good start. Yes, I'm sorry for this. But then all of a sudden, have you noticed that you just keep repeating it anyways? And then you feel like you're saying sorry every single day for the same thing that you just keep repeating because you never get to the real root of the problem. Because with insecurity, the sin actually becomes your identity. Have you ever noticed that? Where a lot of recovery programs used to be is, hi, I'm an alcoholic, my name is, right? And one of the things that I like about CR is that's not it. I'm a child of God who struggles with. It's a struggle, not an identity. Okay? So here's the thing. When sin becomes our identity... It stems, pun intended, it stems from insecurity. So, as my, as, as Brother Zeb loves my, my, my quote here, he just loves it. It rhymes. It's his favorite quote. He, I think his exact words is, that is so corny. I should have used a cornstalk to do my illustration. Huh? All right. If there's a problem with your fruit, you got to check the root. And I know that it may sound silly and fun, funny, kind of weird maybe even. But if there's something that you memorize, I hope it's that. I really do. Because one of the things is this, is that a lot of times what we do is we spend our entire life trying to pluck out the bad fruit from our tree. And we keep throwing it away just for another one to come and take its place and another one to come and take its place. Because we've never went down all the way to the root. Where did this come from? And you know what? I I heard this uh, statistic not too long ago that it said um, 40% of your perceived, perceived happiness is caused by recent events. Therefore, 60% comes from your deep, dark past. 60% of our perceived happiness is from 
So a lot of times we say, I'm not happy because, and then we have this long story about things that have happened in our past. Am I right? How many of you would say that some, a lot of the things from your past has caused you the most pain and a lack of happiness today? Okay. And the thing is, is that we want just, we want it fixed without actually ever dealing with it, don't we? I just want it to go away. I just want it to go away. As if it never happened. But the problem is, is it happens. And the devil knows it happens. And he likes to remind you that it happened. He, the devil loves to remind you of the painful past. And there are people who really just don't want to be happy. I can't tell you how many people I've met as a minister that you, you want to try to help. And they actually love being miserable. Because people feel sorry for them. That's how they get the most amount, amount of help. And just sometimes misery loves company and they like to compare their victim card. You know, everybody's got a victim card. You just have to decide whether you're going to use it or not. Well, this happened to me. Boom, I put it out there. Look at, look at, how, look at what happened in my life. Why I have a reason to be upset. What we do is we use the victim card so that we can justify our behavior. Well, I'm angry because, boom, we put out the victim card. I was taken advantage of. I was hurt. I was abused. And we keep pulling this victim card. We don't actually want to deal with being the victim. We don't want to deal with the past event. We just want to use it to justify our actions today. And then we're miserable. We don't have to be miserable. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 15, we need to look diligently, lest any root of bitterness springs up and causes us trouble. Did you know the little bitter root thrown into a perfectly great well ruins the whole well? So, what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to go home. And give some real thought to what has caused you so much pain in your life. I'm asking you to dig into your past. I'm asking you to get a notebook out and write it down. Everybody who's ever hurt you, all the wrong that's ever happened to you, get it, get it all out and get it done. Deal with it. Put it all on a piece of paper so that you can begin to deal with it. You know what? How many of you have been hurt a lot in your past by people? Come on. Here's the hardest thing. You're going to have to start forgiving them one by one. Or you'll never get over it. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the weeks to come. But I'm wanting you to understand is that if you don't deal with this, then all the people you love most are the ones that are going to get your wrath the most. Have you ever noticed that? That because you haven't dealt with some of the stuff from our, our, our past that's rooted deep in our heart. And you know the Bible says that out of the heart the mouth speaks. So out of that root system that you have deep down in here, it's created your identity. You need a new identity. We're going to talk about that next week. We need a new identity. And when we get saved, God gives us a new identity. Sometimes though we reject the new identity because if, if I accept the new identity, if I accept forgiveness, then I have to forgive. You see, a lot of people say, well, I'm not ready to forgive. Then God says, you're not ready to have forgiveness as your identity then. As long as you want to stay bitter, as long as you're going to stay unforgiven. It's not my word, it's God's word. You see, God wants to give you a new identity. He wants to take all of that pain from your past. And see, I grew up when I was... That, those two right there, when I was about their age, you know, I was a little bit younger when my parents divorced, but my par when my parents divorced, I really had so much anger in my life. I was filled with anger. Now, I really got good at football and wrestling. Wrestling was like a, I could get in a fight without getting in trouble. I didn't like getting in trouble. So wrestling was a fight, and then football, I got to hit people and not get in trouble. I mean, once in a while, you get a flag, but, you know. Make it, you gotta, if you're going to get a flag, you've got to make it worth it. And so, so the thing is, though, is I got to be very, I got to take all of my anger. I loved practices. A lot, a lot of kids today don't like practice. I loved practice because I could still hit hard. 
and I could still wrestle, and I could let it all out every single day that as long as I was involved in some kind of a sport. That's why I was like addicted to sports is because it was how I dealt with my pain because I didn't know Jesus. I knew about him and I knew a lot of him, but I had never allowed him to come be a healer in my heart. And at that time, I used all of that pain and anger so that I didn't have to be healed, so that I could use it to be good at something. So I want to show you the last, we're going to finish out this story because I got I to gotta, I gotta bring this to a close at some point today. We'll just run it right into the next service. Um, but what I love is this. So here's a woman. I want you to remember this woman. So I want you to go home and I want you to write out all of where is all that stuff coming from. Okay? We're going to have to deal with some of that. And you might, I might get a lot of extra phone calls this week and I welcome them. That's why my phone number is on the bulletin. If you're like, I don't know what to do with this list, call me. Call me. We'll start working on it. But here's the thing. So this woman, she has experienced, you know, a face-to-face -face interaction with Jesus. She was at the well. She's been hiding from all the people of the town. Do not forget that. She's hiding from them. She's chained by her past sin, by insecurity, by failed relationships. She doesn't want to go see the people of this town because of what they think of her and what she's done. And then she, she sees Jesus. And all of a sudden, you know, he says, I am he. He's saying, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you're thinking about. Just then, his disciples return. They're surprised to see that he's talking to a woman and a Samaritan woman, right? They're Jews too, so, right? But, but one asks, you know what? So, verse 28, here's then. I want you to think about it. Why did she go to the well? What was her purpose? Just real simple. To get water, right? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. What's so amazing is that her, her old purpose was getting water without being noticed. Now she drops her water bucket. She runs into the town and she tells everyone, the people that she was afraid of, she's no longer afraid of. Her life was changed when she met the Messiah. She's not afraid. So she runs back into town and she tells everybody about the man who told me all my sin. Now her sin's out in the open, right? Tell every, come meet the guy who told me everything I've ever done. And they're like, oh, he told you, does he know everything you've ever done? Right? And so... Verse 29, come and see the man. Verse 30, they came out of the town. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him to eat something. He said, no, I, my food is to do the will of God. What's really amazing is that these, these people, they, they came out because of what she had said. They had not met the man yet. Their lives were changed because she began to deal with that sin. She began to confess her sin. Come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Confessing sin changes how you're seen. I, I really, I, I sit there and think, you know, the Bible and James talks about us to confess, confess our sins to one another. It sounds weird, and this isn't, this isn't a Catholic thing. I mean, the Catholics do it in a different way. It's not how Jesus intended us to confess our sin. He intended us to be accountability partners. He intended us to confess our struggles to one another so that those struggles didn't own us, didn't, didn't put us into slavery. See, the people came not because of Jesus at this moment. They, be, they came because of her. And they came because they saw a change in her. Think about this. Here's a woman who's been avoiding them for who knows how long. Now she's running into the town, screaming throughout the streets, come see the man. She's not hiding anymore. There's immediate change. Have you noticed that when you meet the Savior, there's a change in your life? Sin no longer owns you because you met the Savior? What I love is that she went into the city, said to the men, which men, women didn't talk to men, she said to the men of the city, they came out, in verse 42, they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. But their first 
And the first, they, they came out, verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Because her purpose was changed in a moment, many of them believed because of her word. And then, then they came back and said, we no longer believe because of your word, because of the change we saw in you. Now, we've heard it for ourselves. And it made me think of Romans 9, 17. I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout all the earth. Every one of you has a story. Every one of you has a life that God is trying to get through. And when you truly change inside out, not outside in, but inside out, Everyone around you will begin to see the change in you, and they will be drawn to the same Savior that you were drawn to. If you guys would would bow your heads for a moment. The hardest part about true freedom is standing in it (laughs) because all the other parts are Jesus's part he's the one it's for freedom that Christ has set you free he's the one that gives you the freedom he's the one that breaks the shackles and he does it with such ease because he's all powerful but what I find so inspiring and, 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 and amazing is that he can just he just gives us freedom just like that but then he does tell us he says you gotta stand firm in this freedom that I'm giving you And I don't know about you, but it's hard to stay in that freedom that God has already given us. Why do we keep going back? Why do we keep going back to the same bondage that's destroying us? So I'm here to ask you. A lot of you sitting in here today know that there's some stuff in your past that you haven't dealt with. The hardest thing for any human to do, and this is the opposite of everything that we want to do, is forgive. Amen? It's the hardest thing to forgive people that have hurt you the most. If you don't forgive them, then they will continue to hurt you the rest of your life. Until you don't have a life. That's why Jesus tells us to forgive. He wants us to forgive so that it doesn't destroy us, that they only hurt us that one time, that one moment in time, that one event in time, but that our life is not meant to be hurt the rest of our life. You got to let them go. You got to let it go. So what I'm asking you right now, if there is some things in your past that you haven't let go, just raise your hand right now. There's things in your past that you haven't let You already know what they are. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. I'm begging you to forgive whoever's hurt you. I'm begging you so that they don't have a hold on you anymore. So that you can finally feel the peace that comes in the presence of Christ. If you've got some things in your life right now that you need to forgive, I'm going to invite you to come up to the altar and I'm just going to ask you to lay it down and forgive them. No matter how horrid, no matter how bad it is, it is for you so that you don't have to hold on to it anymore. Give it to Jesus. Let Jesus be the one who deals with the people of your past. Let Jesus be the one. Give them over to him. He's God. Let him deal with them trust God Bible says revenge is mine saith the Lord he'll revenge you whenever he sees fit but today I'm begging you let it go and you may have to let it go every single day for the rest of your life because the devil's going to try to remind you of this. You say, I've already forgiven that. I've already forgiven that. I've already moved on. You're going to have to remind that devil that you've already let it go today. But don't you forget what you do today. 
you start looking at how people have hurt you and the pain that they've caused you and you keep holding on to it, it destroys you. So one last call. There's people in your life that you need to forgive no matter what they did. Right now, come let it go. Let it go. Give it to God. Maybe there's some past sin that you felt so so much shame over. Maybe there's some things that you have done in your life that you just feel like, I, I've been told by so many people that God can't forgive them. That's the lie from hell. Maybe it's just some things in your life that you are still holding and carrying around that you did. Maybe there's some sin that you've done and it's there. I'm asking you to come lay it down and say, God, here's a sin that I've done. I'm so ashamed of it. Acknowledge it and give it to God. God, forgive me. I don't want to hold this anymore. I don't want it anymore. Maybe there's been some failed relationships in your life that you feel like you're chained and you're stuck because you've had so many failed relationships and, and maybe you just need to ask God for forgiveness and maybe you need to pray for the person that you need to go restore a relationship with. Let God do His work in your heart. Forgiveness does not equal reconciliation. Reconciliation is going to take some time. Reconciliation in relationships is going to take some work. You're going to have to work on some things through reconciliation, but you can never reconcile a relationship if there's not forgiveness. If there's not forgiveness, you can never reconcile that relationship. You have to start with forgiveness, then move towards reconciliation. Yeah.